Gary Vaynerchuk is a serial entrepreneur, investor, and one of the most sought after public speakers alive today and a four times New York Times best-selling author. He went from being born in the Soviet Union, living in a studio apartment with eight other family members to building a net worth of $160 million. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, top I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. All my life, like nine to the nine. For my top 10, top 10, top 10, nine to the nine. This one's for my top 10. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Gary Vaynerchuk, and my take on his top 10 rules to success. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, take accountability. If you, even for a second, think it's a good idea for Apple and Google and Facebook to help you be less addicted, you are on the path of losing. You don't like Instagram? Delete it. The second we allow ourselves to let the machines help us help ourselves is the second you become more vulnerable. I believe that. Could you explain that more? Sure. Like, you want Apple to limit the amount of time you're on Instagram for you? Like you think that's the way, that's, that's what, you, you want that? Mazel tov, take it. But like, I promise you, then there's gonna be the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. You're either account, social media is exposing us, it's not changing us. There is no social media, brother. They're empty pipes. Social media doesn't make you mean. Social media doesn't make you insecure. You're insecure, you're mean. We're getting exposed, not changed. We're addicted, to, we're addicted to human interaction. The reason the world exists in a world where we've had atomic bombs for 70 years is we like each other. We're not addicted to social media, we are interactive creatures. You're addicted to people. Cool, you don't wanna be on Instagram? Go read Vogue. Knock yourself out. This is a, this is a very fun thing for me to watch evolve. Um, people don't like being held accountable. So, um, a lot of things, the way that these platforms claim they're addictive is the way a lot of things are addictive. Are we gonna ban pretty people? Are we gonna limit our time to watching comedy? Are we gonna limit the time we listen to music? This is a really, this is the demonization, bless you, this is the demonization of technology. Let me give you a really good piece of advice. Go read the articles around the kaleidoscope. I'm being dead serious. Go Google the early articles around the kaleidoscope. You'll think you're reading about Instagram. History's got all the answers. I failed, I, I could not be in this program because I failed all my classes, but the one class I was good at was history and it is the continuous framework of how I think about a lot of this stuff. Literally the articles of the kaleidoscope are making the same arguments now. So if you have FOMO, it's because you have levels of insecurity that are raging, which has a lot more to do with the way you were parented and where you grew up and the natural DNA you were given, not Snapchat. So how do I think it's gonna play out? In its worst, our government gets disproportionately involved, which will be fine. I could care less. Just so everybody knows, I care about attention, not social media. So if we all stop doing social media, I'm gonna figure out where your eyes and ears are going. You're gonna go somewhere. We're not locking ourselves up in a room. So I don't give a f Google and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok and LinkedIn can disappear off the face of the earth tomorrow and I'd probably be the single happiest person because my most comfortable state is reacting quickly to where attention goes. Um, I just feel bad for any human being that thinks that's gonna help them. Because they're gonna find something else to complain about or to be controlled by. This is an internal framework conversation, not an external technology conversation. Rule number two, be obsessed. 
I'm really in rarefied air of like deep obsession with my process and enjoyment and lack of anxiety from it and lack of burnout from it. I think I hit my crescendo. I think I'm more of an artist. I, I don't think people realize that business women and men are actually, uh, there's a certain version of us that are artists that genuinely like this more than anything. Like, like we, like singing, like Beyonce's a workaholic. Yeah. You know, like Kobe was a workaholic. Obsessing you know, like, over their craft, their art form, yeah. their expression. Yeah. So for me, like, like we demonize it in, in entrepreneurship and corporate life, mm. but we don't in art. We, we put artists, we put, oh, he's in the studio all the time. Wow. You know, painting all the time. Wow. Cooking and traveling the world to buy food. Wow. Business. Oh, he's going to burn out. He's going to suicidal. Why it's is that? Too- is that just because of the old way of thinking, like getting burnt out in the corporate world of doing yeah. a job you hate? Yeah. And- yeah. Money, money. We, you know, I don't think people like Mark Texiera made $213 million playing baseball. But if some entrepreneur makes 30 million, they get demonized. Hmm. It's just culture. It's just culture. And it's okay. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't think that's wrong, right, or indifferent. It's just the obvious observation, yeah. right? We demonize the startup founder or the businesswoman much, much more than the entertainer that makes way more money. Rule number three, worry about your own actions. What you need to do if you have this mission accomplished is worry about your actions, not anybody else's. The biggest problem in our society right now is everybody worries about everybody's actions but their own. on every side of the equation. So what I would tell you to do is what I'm doing for a living, which is I have, all, I have unbelievable social wants of kindness for the world, but I'm not gonna allow my friends to tell me how to do that. My friends tell me I need to be a keyboard water, warrior on Twitter. I think they're full of shit and trying to look good on social media but don't live their truth. So it's about understanding the unique perspective that you bring and not letting other people kind of like play with that. In action, meaning continue to do your podcast, continue to put out content, continue to wear your t-shirt, but not worry about what anybody else is doing with it because when you try to boil the ocean, you don't. Rule number four, be fear proof. What's been your biggest fear in all of this? Or do you feel like you're pretty fear proof at this moment with everything you've been through? I'm fear proof because I'm willing to go to zero. Yeah. You can live on in a small apartment and, you know, live at your parents' house. I really can, man. Yeah. I don't know what else to say. Like, this has proven it to me even more. You know, any 0.0001% of me that thought, well, I've been saying this for the last two years, am I full of shit, has completely gone away. Yeah. Like, I just... I don't fear because I don't value things and money. I, my biggest fear is my parents getting sick. Mm-hmm. Like my biggest fear is like somebody getting sick and dying, nothing else. Like business, I can always, like I'm too capable, right? Like, you know, <laughs> back, to, back to the thing you brought up, back to why you were an Olympian, back to like why you beat me everything, the, anything, when we were on Summit at Sea, things like, like whatever, basketball. Like, <laughs> like, you aren't worried when, when it comes to sport, mm-hmm. you know, you, your mind just goes into, this is going to be a good situation for me. Yeah. And for I feel me, comfortable. Yeah. And for me, that's business. Like I know for fact that if I became a 100% full-time garage sale, thrift store, Amazon flipper, that I'd make a million dollars a year. Yeah. I, I, I know that for fact. So what the hell am I? Yeah. And that doesn't take into account that I am that I built a brand. And sure, my brand would take a hit if I all my businesses went to zero. But the reality is, America's funny, man. Like, there's people following and helping OJ Simpson. There's you know Wolf of Wall Street. Like, like this is a country that gives second, third, fourth chances regardless. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I'm already at a place right now where between brand and capability and humility, I'm bulletproof. Yeah. Also, if you want to have unstoppable confidence, self-love, and motivation, check out my 254 series. They're free. The links to join are in the description below. We are strong as We're really strong. We're just being sold that we're not because there's a lot of money. You need to put your earpods in and listen to positivity 24-7 to get you through that Do you understand? When your surroundings are your insides got to be positive. The biggest obstacle uh, to success is a lack of of optimism. Rule number five, focus on the end result. The reality is I know what's going on in the Vayner world. Obviously, I know what's going on 
uh, in the broad sense, but I, I spend almost no time auditing what other brands are doing. And plus, if we're talking from a brand standpoint, well has to be reflected in business results. There's a ton of people that are gonna win awards today that business is declining dramatically. And I struggle with that because the point of that creativity is to drive a business result in this context or get people to vote or inspire a movement or cure a disease. Like, what's the point of output if you're not getting the end result? Rule number six, live your truth. I think the reason my voice is resonating is I'm not affected by anybody else right now. I'm only affected by the way people are reacting to me which allows me to continue to build in the purity of human truths without blending and trying to be like. So you're clearly a very busy guy with <laughs> controlling your public image and... You'll appreciate this real quick on that front. Just to jump okay. in, I'll let you finish. I give zero thoughts to controlling my public image. Mm-hmm. Zero. I mean, they doc. My team's in here. I don't even look at what they're making. The way I control my public image is by living my truth and letting the chips fall. It's the most liberating thing of all time. I don't think about it at all. Rule number seven, have a balance. I do think my parents, for me, and they parented all three kids a little bit differently, but like, but they're like, we really, they were such workaholics, both my mom, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, but like, did everything. Like, you know, like, like, you know, and I think people very much underestimate stay at home moms as workaholics. Like she just worked her face off, no help. No breaks. No breaks. We were all spoiled kids from the fact of laundry and doing our bed and she cooked everything. And like, and then my dad came home late because and cooked for him. Like she worked her face off. So they could have created a little more balance. We only took two family vacations. So they taught me work ethic, kindness, everything. Everything I am is them. But, but I do think the thing that we have more is balance with, you know, leisure and, and offsetting 24-7 work. But they, that makes sense. It's generational. They came here with nothing and it was 24-7 work. And I have so much of that in me, but I've had the luxury of my talents leading to a success that's allowed me to post, you know, listen, that's how my first 10 years professionally looked too, but now being able to take a little bit of time. And so maybe a little balance because I think they regret that and, and so you try to take your parents' regrets and not have the same. Yeah. And so I, I look at that. Rule number eight, create clarity. I care about people's emotions and happiness and, and overall livelihood, not what they produce for me in the short term as an employee of my company. I don't know what else to say. I care more about, I look at our voluntary retention numbers 10 times more than I look at our profit margin. And. I'm, I'm an HR driven CEO, not a CFO driven CEO. Here's why, I want to create clarity for everybody who's listening. Because I'm playing forever. I own my businesses. I'm, so for me, I can do things that lead to retention and a real relationship. Because I'm not held accountable to Wall Street or a public market or a board or am so money hungry that I want a yacht. And I believe most are. Rule number nine, be thoughtful. What is amazing about the volume model is the notion of marketing for the sake of better marketing. So what happens after you post those 78 is you start getting quant and qual feedback. And what you do with that feedback is you make the next decision, which is are you gonna write more about that or has there been such a huge reaction to people's response on what 5G actually means to their day to day, not just faster and better battery, but how our entire world changes when you create that speed of information, how that actually makes autonomous cars real, how that actually allows a doctor in Peru to perform a surgery on somebody in New York, how that actually, actually, actually does. When you see the response Now all of a sudden you say, you know what? That little three sentences we said about did you know when 5G is in your life, this happens, got such a big response. Why don't we now have our graphic designer make an infographic real quick around five things you don't know about 5G and let's post that at 3.37 p.m. today. And then when that goes well, 
then you decide, why don't we make a quick little video on our iPhone talking to Lars in R&D? He knows a lot about this shit. Let's go over to him, Lars says it, and then you just post it, not with what's quality, with green screen and lighting. I mean, I was powdered before I came out here right now. <laughs> <laughs> that to me is not the variable of success of this talk. <laughs> That was not gonna be the variable that made this go well or not. (laughs) It was what I was gonna say. And Lars with an iPhone with bad lighting saying something thoughtful and then that posted at 7.04 p.m. on our Twitter to the small group that cares matters. And so when you get into that mindset, you can see how it works and it's really just having writers, designers, something we call predators, shredders, which are people who can film and post produce for the channel all in one person. Talent, humans, commitment to being able to pay those people to do the thing because you value that more than the lighting in your booth at, <laughs> in Spain at a conference. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip is test and learn. The single thing I'm most proud of sitting at Cannes is there's not a human here, not one, that makes more creative output than I do on a daily basis and collective, period. That is an audacious but factual statement. There's not one person here that makes more content than I do. And I'm a CEO of a company, not a creative. And in that, you can imagine, in a world where me and my team are producing 40 to 100 pieces of content a day, across all these platforms, there's a practitionership that allows me, I mean, the amount of mistakes, you know, it's fun to have DRock here because he's on the text chain with me and my team. We change our mind seven times a month. I constantly shit on my own self once a week. Like, I emphatically on Monday say, it's all about this, and literally next Tuesday go, if we ever do that again, we're fit, I mean, this is real life. This is the truth. So and you're it, testing and learning with yourself. At, at a scale that is unseen right now and should be replicated by everyone, which gives me much better insights to what the consumer's reacting to. And then obviously I'm a human with a certain kind of flavor, so that doesn't map to Dove the same exact way. So there's macro things we see that we deploy and then we see how it plays out. It's never literal for me to, I'm a human, I'm, I'm a 43 year old male. There's a lot of things that don't navigate, but there's a lot of the truths that we navigate that we test and learn there and that we scale. So. It is the ultimate test lab. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know, what was your single biggest takeaway from this video? And write down in the comments below when you're going to take action on that takeaway this week. When you schedule in what day, what time, and what place you're gonna take action, you have a 91% chance of actually following through, compared to just 35% if you just got motivated but never created a plan. And when you share your plan and have accountability, you give yourself an even higher chance of following through. So in the comments below, write down your single biggest takeaway as well as your specific plan of action because I want to celebrate with you. We're talking about authenticity yes. in a brand. What does it mean to you from a brand communication? You know, it's, this is an interesting question. I have a pretty, for this world, a pretty left field point of view on this. And my point of view is that we need to achieve relevance. I'm looking at 11, 12, 13 faces right now and what Pepsi or BMW or Coca-Cola or Facebook means to all these people is actually different. And so for me, authenticity gets very close to relevancy because when you're a big brand, there are so many variables in your world. There's so many things that you're doing. You know, some people may drink a cola to get a burst of energy. Others, it may be a reminder of spending time with their grandmother. And I think we're so literal in today's brand and marketing world. We're so stuck on sentences and adjectives and we spend so much time on subjective things that don't matter to the consumer on the other end. So my perspective is, much like a human being, you and I are gonna act differently right now as humans in this interview than if we were with our family, than if we were on a weekend in Las Vegas with our best friends, than if we were presenting to 5,000 people. People are always like, Gary, you're a little bit different than when you I see you on video. I'm like, yeah, I'm on stage to 7,000 people versus I'm here with you. There's different versions. And I think people struggle in ad land 
to understand things that are multi-dimensional. And so for me, authenticity is actually being comfortable in the 74 to 7400 variations of how you show up. And so I think that we are, uh, that human beings, executives, are limiting brands' ability to be authentic because they want it to be so literal and so safe and so PR'd and so approved by the queen bee that, uh, that I think we live in a very non-authentic world. And I think the reason humans continue to scale in popularity is they're a focus group of the audience. They're, uh, they're, a, they're an executive group of one. And I, I think one of the reasons real celebrities are struggling and have lost share is they do have PR people. They do have big deals with movie studios that they're scared of breaking. And so I think anyone who could actually show all the versions of themselves will win. And I think right now the creative industry, A, isn't set up to make enough creative. B, has way too much B2B DNA in it to actually show up authentic. And this is not schizophrenia, this is not throw up against the wall and see what sticks, this is not being scattered, this is being true. And so I think authenticity uh, has a far more, uh, at its end, there's always a, something that delivers at the end, a piece of content or creative, and I think it's being far more wide than it's been over the last 80 years. Evan, thank you so much for having a couple seconds and being able to tell the Believe Nation a little bit about Empathy Wines. It means a lot to me that you would take this valuable real estate and, and time on your channel to give me some love. It means a lot. It's just good karma points and so you're just, you're awesome, thank you. Believe Nation, uh, if you're into wine at all, go to empathywines.com. My whole career's work was poured into producing a wine that rivaled 40 to $60 wine for 20 bucks a bottle. Uh, I'm just super excited about this subscription-based wine business. You can order three, six, or 12 bottles in subscription form, rosé, white, red. Um, if, you, if you search on Instagram or, or Twitter, you will be blown away. People are literally like, I don't even like Gary Vee, but the wine's good. Super proud of the effort. Thanks, Evan, for the time. Uh, wishing you guys all happy and healthy. If you want to learn how to market on social media like Gary Vee, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there.